Okay. And we're live. That looks like it is recording. I know you can stop and start when we actually start if you want to, or we can just keep it rolling. Okay, and I see uh, 11 attendees. Okay. Well, I see him. Do you have to approve them in? Uh, see. I think everybody's on mute. I don't see anybody. Oh, wait. See Janelle on there. Oh, there we go. Okay, they're not showing up here. They're just showing up in the chat, I guess. Yeah. yeah I don't know. I don't see them at all. Oh, there we go. Up to the side. There we go. We see you guys. We see you. <laughs> I'm used to seeing all the faces here, you know, like on the screen. So this is a different format and that's great. We can see you over there. See Brittany and Chris and Courtney, a couple of Courtney's. Good to see you guys. There we go. As you can tell, this is kind of new for us and we're figuring this out as we go, but, um, and the attendees are continuously going up and I appreciate y'all joining us today. Yes, we see Susan and Tamara and Teresa. Hi guys, Ray. I don't know. Um, oh, there we go. Some people are tuning in on the chat. On the chat at the bottom of your screen, you can type in there. We'd love to know who all's here and where you're from. Hi, Janelle. <laughs> Yeah, you'll you'll notice if you start typing. Uh, there we go. Hi from Klein. Hi. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Hi, Teresa. If you press enter, it won't go down to the next line. It like just go. I've done that before, and you have to enter it all at once. But put where you're in your contact info. That would be great. We would love to be able to stay in touch with everybody. Yeah. Hey Ray from Nacogdoches. That's yeah. where I went to the SFA down there in Nacogdoches. Yes. And tell us as you're tuning in also, um, who are you? Are you a counselor? Oh, there we see, we have Dan, who's an LCDC, great. Hey, Dan. Janelle, hi, Janelle. Hope Foundation, great. Neurofeedback, fantastic. Awesome. So glad to have you guys here. Yeah. Hey, Mary. Lord. This is so cool. It's yeah. so neat with the Spiritual Care Network bringing everybody together across Texas. I love that. Hi, Mary Ortiz from Key Programs in Houston. All right, Lone Star. Great, all over. I love that. Oh, I see someone is Dallas. Marion in Dallas, transition counselor. Awesome. Ray, are you not from Texas? Let us know. <laughs> oh, Spring, Texas. Okay, you are. <clears throat> I think we're mostly all Texas here, right? Well, I did send this out um, to other states, Oklahoma. There was a lot of people in Oklahoma and Louisiana. Uh, not many on my database from that. That's okay, Kim. Kim says she doesn't have video on her computer. That's all right. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Courtney with Ascension Behavioral Health, LCSW. I'm a counselor with the heart of a social worker, so I love the social workers. Hey, Kimberly. Great. Last month, social worker month. Did I, did I miss that? Stephen Murphy, all right. San Antonio. Hi, Susan. Susan's coming in from Montgomery County, juvenile probation. Great. Awesome. Good to have you. And I'm seeing some people that are joining us with that would be great speakers in the future too. So uh, okay. y'all uh, email me if you have my email information and let me know when you want to speak. Aisha's here from Dallas County. Fantastic. Good deal. Ray wants to present. Okay, Ray. All right. Well, cool. Well, um, <clears throat> looks like we, uh, we're about there at noon. So let me just kind of start first. Um, 
and talk about the Spiritual Care Network and what we're all about. A lot of people may be new. Um, the Spiritual Care Network, the purpose is to bring the, bridge the gap, we say, between mental health and faith. Uh, we uh, are mostly comprised of uh, Christian counselors, uh, faith leaders from churches, recovery group leaders, uh, staff from mental health and addiction treatment centers, um, but it's a wide variety of people, the professionals that come together to bridge that gap. And um, we want to encourage um, spirituality in the treatment process. And we also want to be resources for our churches because a lot of people go to, um, go to our faith leaders when, um, when they're struggling. Um, oh, uh, let's see. Gary Cohorn is on the line here. Let me find Gary. He um, is going to actually start us with a word of prayer if I could find you. Let me just see if I can. Oh, there you are. Uh, Gary, you are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Gary, uh, Gary's yeah. one of the leaders of the Dallas Spiritual Care Network yeah. and to open us up with a word of prayer today. Good to see friendly faces in a coronavirus culture. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I just didn't, you tell me when I, I'm good. Well, all right, let's, let's go ahead and open it up. Uh, I appreciate you being on today. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's pray together. Father God, we are thankful that we can come in a, in a crazy culture of, uh, this virus that's, uh, affected not only our, our Dallas Fort Worth area, our state, our country, our world. And, uh, it's caused some anxiety and it's caused some fear and some unrest and people feeling unsettled and all that but uh, but we also know that as surely as that's the case you're a god that heals and one that uh, brings calm and peace and comfort and confidence and you're with us now your presence is with us now we thank you for that we thank you for your for your presence and for the way that you step in and provide all that we need we're also thankful for technology. And so when things like this happen, when we're, when we're uh, kind of locked down or quarantined at our own spaces, we can still connect with each other. So we are thankful to do that. I very much am thankful for those that are on this call, those that I know and plenty that, I, that I'm, I, I'm not aware of that are on the call. We just ask you to bless this time, bless this initiative that we have in our different cities to merge faith with mental health, addiction recovery, all those spaces so that we can we can have you present and all that. Help us to enjoy this time together and thank you for Carrie and her willingness to, to present today. We just pray that you'll be with her and thank you for Eric and his coordinating. May you bless all that takes place here and that we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gary. All right. Thank you. Well, let me introduce myself uh, and then we'll get into our presentation with Carrie. Uh, my name is Eric Ailes. I am a full-time job. I work at Starlight Recovery Center in uh, in Kerr, near Kerrville, Texas, that one of the oldest addiction treatment centers in Texas. So we, uh, we have a residential drug and alcohol treatment program. And we do have a Christian track called The Journey and a beautiful chapel on campus. And um, people get a lot of uh, a good uh, uplifting from that. And um, the other thing I do is I'm the board president for the Spiritual Care Network. Um, the Spiritual Care Network, we have 10 locations around Texas. Uh, we have Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, Corpus Christi, Austin, San Antonio, and four in Houston. We have North Houston in the Woodlands, uh, Katy, centrally located in uh, Houston, and also in the Clear Lake area. So um, if you want to know more information about the uh, Spiritual Care Network, you can go to spiritualcarenet.org. And it, there's a listing of the locations and where we where and when we meet when we're not in quarantine. So. Uh, for now, this is going to be a great um, way to bring everybody together. I really think that God is using this opportunity to, to bring us all together throughout Texas and maybe even uh, internationally. And uh, we have some great things coming. Um, I know Janelle's on the line and she's going to be helping us with um, a membership program. Um, we are offering more CEU events. Uh, a lot of the chapters have uh, conferences. Um, we just had some in the Houston area in January, and um, I know more are planning later on in the year and early next year. So um, 
We do have an active Facebook page, um, pages, I guess. A lot of the different uh, cities have a, a page. Uh, Houston is a great page to find resources and updates on events. So um, go to the, uh, the Houston Area Spiritual Care Network or just the Spiritual Care Network Facebook page. So uh, that's all I have to say. Well, I really appreciate, I'm down in Houston actually, and Carrie is up in Denton. And she's kind of experienced being on Facebook. And um, so I thought this was a great way to start our first ever webinar CEU event. And I'll turn it over to you, Carrie. All right. Yay. I feel like, where's my confetti? I need to be throwing it. I do actually <laughs> not confetti here. I do a lot of live video. And so, yes, we will celebrate with some <laughs> literal confetti. <laughs> Um, so good to see you guys here and Eric thank you so much for asking putting the word out and asking for someone to present and letting me be the first so I love that um, I do a lot of live video I'm going to share my screen and tell you just a little bit about me for those who don't know and for those who are just turning tuning in right now um, go ahead and drop in the chat who you are where you're coming in from any contact information you may be able to connect with some people I know I saw there Marlene with um, a caring hospice organization, love to connect with hospice organizations um, and what I do. So, so good to see you guys. Um, the video is turned off for other people on video. So it'll just be the presenters on the video today. And so I'm going to share my screen with you and let's hope this all works correctly. So y'all can let me know if you're seeing everything. How's that looking on everybody's end over there? Is that looking good? Looks good to me. And uh, let me also add before you start, um, we will have a link at the end and also an email going out afterwards with a link to uh, do your evaluation if you need your CEUs. Once you complete your evaluation, uh, it'll email you a certificate. So uh, for that to come, if not, uh, reach out to me and I'll be glad to get that to you. So Great. Okay. So I'm going to try to keep every, I have like five different screens going here. So let's hope this works well. So as you ha have seen on when you registered, um, this topic today is about how we are, it says socially distant, but in reality, it's not social distance. We're being social right now. It is physically distant and we want to still go spiritually deep with people. We ourselves have the experience of anxiety and worry and fear, and so do those that we care for. And so how can we nurture them? How can we understand anxiety on some different levels for ourselves first? And then how can we help those in turn? So let's see if this will progress on. There we go. Okay. So this is a little bit about me. Um, I was raised in Carrollton, Texas, and that's just a little bit south of Denton and a little bit north of Dallas, just barely north of Dallas. I'm a two-time graduate of UNT, and I have my master's in rehab counseling there from the rehab and health services department. And I also have a CRC. That's what the CRC came from, from that program. It's Certified Rehab Counselor. So great program and love what they're doing there at UNT. I've been married for 15 years to my husband, John. And we've actually been on a 15 year journey of infertility as well. So that is a lived experience that I have. A lot of just a big grief journey that we've been through as a couple. And my husband also has a complicated grief story. So grief is close to my heart. And as we'll talk about a little bit today, anxiety and anger and grief and all these emotions really intertwine together in a lot of different ways. So I've also been 20 years in the mental health field. A good majority of that time, the first about 15 of it, was spent at Denton County MHMR. I did um, intensive case management and crisis intervention services there and some counseling services there as well. I love that time there. I consider myself an MHMR alumni. So if you work at MHMR or you ever have, hey, I see Miranda showing up there. Hey, Miranda. Um, with Mayhill. So if you have ever worked at MHMR, let me know. I was also team lead of ACT Team. So if you're familiar with ACT Team and you have worked with them, um, I feel you and I'm there with you. <laughs> you do a lot of good work. So, so grateful for all of you who are working hard out in the community right now. Um, we do not have any children. As I said, we're on that infertility journey. And so we are though proud cat parents. And I would love to know if you're a cat person or a dog person. I am a cat person. You see her there. Her name is Melly but she doesn't even go by that name. We call her Meow Mix. And she is in full control of that remote, AKA the house. <laughs> so she rules the roost over here. Um, but my favorite food is Mexican food. And I love that. I'm looking forward to when we can get back to our favorite restaurants out there and get some good Mexican food. You're seeing a picture of me there that looks like something like I'm holding a mask in front of my face. It's actually my face. It's an illusion. One of the things I do on the side is I have a makeup and skincare business that funnels profits into a counseling scholarship fund in my private practice. 
for women who have financial need to receive counseling cares. Thank you, all of you. Hey, Yolanda and Mary Lou, loving the cats. Okay, good. I have some cat lovers out there with me. I love that. So I am um, the owner and founder of a beauty and skincare business that does that as well. So that's kind of my thing that I do for fun. So what's your what's your fun way of de-stressing outside of your professional job that you may have? Um, and then I am a telehealth counselor. So I do virtual based counseling. Um, before we were having the stay at home rules and some of those things, I did some in-person counseling as well but I love the virtual space and it's a really great opportunity. So just a little bit about my practice. I have, um, I do biblically based Christian counseling with women going through life transition and life loss. And I have got too many screens up. So let me move some things around so I can see what I'm talking about here. <laughs> and so I do the virtual therapy, both in person and, or not in person, but individual based one-on-one -on -one, and also group. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. This is showing a little flyer of a group that I've got going right now that just started and another one that I'll be starting up um, in May as well for the same thing. And I do free 20 minute phone consults. Really my heart for women is helping them find joy on their unchosen journey. Okay, so let's get into what we're talking about today. So today, this is sort of the outline of where we are headed. We're gonna talk a little bit about the origins of anxiety, the experience of anxiety, both just physically, emotionally, cognitively, at the heart level, spiritually, and some spiritual implications, as well as some complications. What are things we need to be paying attention to um, when it comes to anxiety, even in ourselves? And then we'll end it with the art of nurturing and some practical tips and things that I've used as well in my own practice. And hopefully you'll share some of yours as well as we go through. So I really want to remind you that this is our roadmap. This is where we're headed. And this is first of all for you. Um, because there is something that I know about you, and it's that you have struggled with anxiety as well, um, just the same as I have, and probably more so than maybe you care to admit. So this is first and foremost for you, and a verse that I really love comes from 2 Corinthians, and it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So I hope that you'll receive some comfort today and that you'll be thinking through how you can take something away for yourself and then in turn use that comfort for others. So I will be infusing um, just practical principles and things throughout this chat. One of the things that I encourage my clients to consider is what can they remember and then what can they do? What are some truths that they can hold on to and then what can they do with those truths? All right, so the next thing we're moving into here is just the origins of anxiety. Where does this come from? Where does it begin? Where does the anxious soul get st started in all of this? Um, so as we know, anxiety is a response to a perceived or actual threat. And that can be past, present, or future. And so um, it's really kind of interesting that not only do we have a physical response to anxiety and there's physical things that are going on in our body, um, but there's also things like our thoughts and our beliefs and our desires, things that we love, things that we want, and how that interplays. We are making meaning of our circumstances. And where is there a desire that's unfulfilled? And how am I interpreting my circumstance based on a thwarted desire, a thwarted value even, something that I felt was threatened? Also with trauma, um, Ed Welch is a Christian-based author, and one of the things he says in a sermon that he has done on anxiety, which I've linked at the end of this, is the body sometimes doesn't get the message that the war is over. And I love that quote because it just made me think about those who've experienced trauma. And we work with people, and I'm sure you do as well. So um, the physical, sometimes the body can imitate fear without being afraid. Ed Welch says that as well. It can imitate fear without being afraid. And so there are some physical and medical conditions. And I want to talk just a little bit about that. I found this in this article I linked to, I have a whole reference list at the end, but I love this little acronym. Have you heard of this before? Think Med, T-H-I-N-C-M-E-D, Think Med. Med. And um, yes, you will be able to access the recording, I believe, afterwards. We are recording this. So these are just some different physical things that could be going on that will mimic the feeling and experience of anxiety. So tumors is one and how they impact the body, hormones, hypothyroidism in women, some estrogen 
related concerns can produce anxiety symptoms, also infectious diseases like Lyme disease as well. And um, nutrition, vitamin deficiency, or in excess of vitamin or a deficiency in it, malabsorption, poor nutrition, it can really mimic that range of emotional disorders. Also a vitamin B12 deficiency as well can present with some anxiety symptoms, central nervous system, head trauma, even mild head trauma as well. Um, as we know, just literal trauma that people have experienced as a child um, and how that has impacted their genetic makeup. Um, miscellaneous things, there's a variety of other diseases and conditions and things that mimic psychological related symptoms. Um, electrolyte abnormalities, environmental toxins as well, long-term exposure to insecticides in, as well can result in anxiety and also restlessness. Um, drugs, over-the-counter, homeopathic, both prescribed, unprescribed, illicit drugs, all can produce this wide range of psychological symptoms. As we know, alcohol withdrawal also, the DTs, you know, when people are tremoring, you know, you see tremors, you see the jumping of the knees or the shaking of the hands internally that almost even you may have someone talk about the internal feeling of anxiety, feeling like the insides are moving. Maybe the outside isn't moving, but their insides feel like they're moving as well. Um, cocaine, other stimulants can result in anxiety related symptoms. So this is kind of the experience of anxiety, physical, emotional, cognitive, and then also I want to add on to that beliefs and values. That's what I like to talk about as the heart level. So we're going to talk about the experience of anxiety in terms of the physical. Think about this and really take this moment to evaluate just for yourself in the last week, in the last month, how many of these have you experienced yourself? Have you been feeling restless? Have you been feeling um, like just so tense and tight? I went for it. There we go. Being restless, hard to sit still, difficulty concentrating, being easily annoyed by things. I think those of us who, and I'm not a parent, but I've heard from many parents who have kids at home just they're feeling like their frustration tolerance is low. Where do you feel it in your body? Let us know down there. Let's all kind of chime in together. Where have you felt it in your body? Is it the feeling of nauseousness in your stomach? Is it tension in your shoulders? Are you getting kind of that heart pounding sort of feeling? Maybe the dizziness even a little bit or a dry mouth. Really understanding someone's experience of anxiety and how it can differ from person to person is the beginning of being able to nurture and help care for them is really understanding what it's like for them and helping them slow down. Anxiety moves fast. And so we want to slow the flow and go with a slower flow. I'm gonna just briefly touch on freeze, flight, fight, Right, all of the, those that you've heard. I have an article linked at the end here, and I was talking to Eric about this in the beginning. I had not heard of this. Tell me if you've heard of this. Freeze, fight, flight, fright, flag, and faint. I had not heard of those last two, flag and faint. And so just the body goes through this period of the startle response. And I'm going to tell you just a real quick story. Um, my husband has a friend who came over to visit us, and I did not know that he was coming. He's a big, burly dude, and I had no idea he was coming. Husband wasn't home. I'm by myself. He comes to the door. I'm sitting on the chair, just probably tooling around online or something, and he um, police knocks on the door. Bam, 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 bam. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I had that, I initially froze and I kind of like startle response, what's going on out there? I'm not even, I wasn't clothed in a way that I would want to answer the door <laughs> in that manner. And so I'm thinking, I'm trapped. I can't get to the bedroom because the door is in between and we have like a, you know, mirror, kind of like an open door type situation, you know, where you can see through like a glass type thing. So anyway, I had that feeling of, oh my gosh, what do I do? And so I jumped up and I'm like, where do I go? And I thought, should I run outside and jump over the fence? <laughs> that was my flight. I got to get out of here. And I thought, I, I'm certainly not going to fight that dude. And, and then it was sort of like this paralyzed fright turtle tuck in. I hid behind the chair. I literally hid behind the chair. And so this is a physical experience of anxiety. It was a perceived threat. He wasn't an actual threat, but it felt like it. And I told it, my husband, told my husband later, you tell him never do that again. <laughs> Don't ever do that again to me. That was terrible. So we have a physical response, but then we also have the emotional response. So the fear, the being keyed up on edge, excessive worrying, difficulty to stop that worry. I was feeling trapped, that feeling no way out, you know, isolated, lonely, feeling like nobody else is maybe understanding those things. I'm even kind of embarrassed, a little shame related to that, feeling maybe criticized or rejected. 
And then we have just thoughts like, I can't do this. What are the thoughts that you think when you're feeling anxious? What thoughts have you been thinking? What if I look stupid? What if nobody gets this? You know, I have those thoughts even coming into this presentation, you know, just the fear of man. What are other people going to think? You know, also thoughts of like, get me out of here. I've talked to many clients who are inside grocery stores and other places and they're like, I just can't do this. I got to get out. Got to go. Got to go. You know, and it's just that cycle, almost that hamster wheel of rapid thoughts going in their minds. And because of that, then they feel I'm going crazy because I can't thought stop the thoughts, feeling trapped, almost that even that suffocating feeling, which goes back to the physical. And then the what ifs, what if this, what if this, what if this happens? Have you experienced that also? Let us know. So then we have the beliefs and the values. Which of these beliefs and values do you strongly hold to? This is not an exhaustive list. So do you strongly value independence and now you're not able to be as independent as you were in going and doing the things? You strongly value social gatherings, getting together. We can't be doing that right now in the way that we were before. Um, controlling, wanting to control things, financial security. So many people's jobs have been impacted. Um, just the social connections, maybe cleanliness. And now this is a whole nother level. There's people that are sanitizing their groceries and some things like that. So, and other people are not. So just how are these beliefs and values being impacted? And whenever I have someone that's telling me they're strongly anxious, strongly angry even about something, I always like to say, what is something you feel like it, you're valuing right now that is being threatened? And how can you identify that? Because it sort of shifts it a little bit and helps us see it in a new way. Maybe you strongly value calmness and predictability, and we're not in a season like that right now. Okay, so what are some complications? Many of you were chiming in to say that you're working in the field. You are licensed professionals in some way. And so secondary trauma, also vicarious trauma, I'm gonna show you some differences that I thought were really significant and interesting, but some secondary trauma is occurring when you're exposed to someone else who has also experienced trauma and you're listening to that. Um, symptoms are very similar to those who have actually experienced a literal trauma. Um, very common in first responders, healthcare workers, um, mental health professionals. You know, those who are working in mental health, I say this because someone said it to me once in a presentation and I was like, oh, I didn't realize that. I'm, I was a first, I'm a first responder too as someone working in crisis and in mental health. Also, I would include in that list spiritual care personnel. If you're a faith related leader on church staff or pastoral staff, you're anyone who's listening to other people. Even these are, it's common in these people, but maybe you have friends who've experienced trauma and you've been a listening ear to them. This can be real for you as well. So these are similar, but a little different than compassion, fatigue, and burnout. So here's just a nice way of sort of breaking up all of those different types of ways we can be impacted comparing the three. The vicarious trauma, that cumulative transformative effect upon the person who is working with survivors. And then also secondary trauma, which, you know, that's indirect exposure, but to the details of a traumatic experience. And so maybe it's just hearing of it, you know, maybe you're an empath. Are you an empath? I know a lot of people are in the helping profession are empathic and they really feel with other people. And so that can be um, something to consider. Also compassion fatigue. You have strong compassion for people if you're in this field. So sometimes having that preoccupation and absorbing the trauma or the emotional stresses of other people. And then burnout is just you're worn out. It, compassion fatigue has dragged on and on and now you're burnt out. The difference I thought was significant that someone pointed out in an article I read between burnout and compassion fatigue is just burnout kind of emerges over time. Compassion fatigue, if you're able to identify it and recognize where you're feeling fatigued, that can be managed earlier and help to hopefully prevent some of that burnout. Okay, I'm not going to spend much time on this other than just to say that with burnout, some of the signs are more related to anger and negativity, compassion. Um, in the section under compassion fatigue is more related to sadness and grief. And then the vicarious and secondary trauma tends to be more centralized around anxiety and confusion. But you see the overlap between all three of those. And then this is just another little thing. There's a link to this also in the uh, resources at the end. I love this little graphic there of just kind of looking at the triggers and how they all kind of 
coincide and kind of intermingle together. So what leads to burnout? This is really important for you who are in the field right now, you who are helping people also. The, uh, the aftermath of all of this, you know, this is going to be ongoing, you know, really for the rest of this year and, and beyond in terms of how people are processing things. So our, look at this list and say to yourself, and go ahead and drop down there in the chat, which of these do you feel like you've been doing? Are you vulnerable and able to say that right now? I have really not been delegating. I haven't been taking the breaks. I've squeezed out my hobbies. I've squeezed out even my spiritual growth time. I know how important it is. I tell other people to do it, but I'm not doing it. So this is an encouragement to you of just look at this and do a little evaluation for yourself. Am I being perfectionistic about my work? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Um, am I procrastinating? I could probably raise my hand just about all of these. Um, am I not talking about it? So this is an opportunity, even just in a chat form, to talk about it. Am I taking on too many issues right now? You're going to struggle to nurture others if you're not taking care of yourself. we got to put on that oxygen mask first. So let's talk a little bit about spiritual implications. Um, I come from a um, Christian background, grew up in church at a small Baptist church that really taught God's word, taught through the Bible expositionally, which means verse by verse and really looking at it, studying it, looking at the context of things. And so that's just a little disclosure here as we move into this part. That's the perspective that I'm coming from here when we talk about spiritual implications. I love to see what, where do we see anxiety showing up in the Bible. We see it right off the bat. We can't even get out of the Garden of Eden before we see it, that Adam and Eve took of the fruit, they sinned, and then they realized they had done something wrong. There was guilt, there was shame, and what they do? They felt afraid, and they hid, and we know they're afraid because God later, they say later to God when he asked them, where are you? What's going on over there? And they say, I heard, he says, he asked them, where are you? And then Adam answers, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. They experienced fear right off the bat, and how, what can we learn from how God interacted with them right at the beginning. He did not chastise them for that. He spoke to them. He asked them to draw near, invited them back into a relationship with them, with him. We see it in Moses when he says to God, who am I that I should go? Fear of man. What, who, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to say? What, what if, what if? There's those what ifs. He's in his head. He's, he's cognitively anxious here. <laughs> and I'm sure he was feeling it, probably pounding heart as well, right? What if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? Have you said that? Have you said that with, your, with the people you're working with? What if they don't listen to me? And God is so faithful to encourage and remind them and remind Moses that he made his mouth. He will help him. And then finally, at the end, he's like, all right, fine. I'll give you your brother. Let your brother do the talking for you, but I'm there for you. So we can take any of these characters and really turn their story into a dialogue with God you know, using the, the scripture even for someone that is coming from that Christian, maybe faith-based perspective and saying, wow, Moses felt that too. Do you, do you say what is to you? What are some of your what is? This was Moses. What if, do you relate to that? Elijah as well. He was afraid and ran for his life. Flight. He is in that flight mode. And he also prayed that he might die. He was so overcome by what was going on. He had had enough. He said, I've had enough. Have you said that? Take my life. Just This is what we call passive thoughts of death. I'm not actively planning it, but God, just take my life. I just want to disappear from here. Just let me die. And then he laid down and he fell asleep. That kind of goes back to what we we're talking about, the flight, fight, freeze. I didn't tell you the last ones. The flag is like, warning, we're about to faint. It doesn't say he's fainted. He fell asleep. But we're so worn out. That's that exhaustion that anxiety brings. Also, King David, he, in the Psalms, I mean, we can just like, thumb through the Psalms and tell me what Psalms you are loving down there. Um, I call as my heart grows faint. That, that's speaking of a physical thing, a physical feeling, calling for help, in distress, could not be comforted, feeling like you cannot be consoled, groaning. And I want to spend a little time here on Psalm 94. In Psalm 77, it says, will the Lord reject me forever? This is questioning. People are questioning. I'm feeling so anxious and it's just going on and on. Does that mean that God's rejecting me forever? Is he never going to show his favor again? We're asking God these questions. We can encourage people when they're asking questions that 
The psalmist did too. David did too. We're question, questioning God's love. Has his unfailing love? I know his love is unfailing, but I'm questioning, has it just vanished? Has it vanished forever? Has his promise failed? It's okay to ask those questions and just put those out there. And Psalm 94, I love this one. This is just a great little exercise. Like I said, anxiety moves fast. How can we slow things down? And we slow things down by talking about it, by writing about it, by reading about it, asking questions. So here he says, when anxiety was great within me, and that word anxiety also means in, in the original text, disquieting thoughts, those disquieting thoughts, those troublesome thoughts, they're great. They're abundant. It's not just one troublesome thought. It's a lot of them. And they are racing all over the place. There's a multitude of them. They feel like they're taking over. And that feeling though, then becomes paired with another belief. Your joy brought consolation to me. And you can even sit with someone and say, I wonder what that means. What does your joy mean? Maybe you would look that up. I love using Blue Letter Bible. Have you used that before? The blueletterbible.org. It's a great resource and tool where you can look up verses and words, lots of commentaries and things there all in one place. It's called Blue Letter because, you know, things that you can click on online are blue. You know, you see them in blue, so it's Blue Letter Bible. What does that word joy mean? Your joy brought consolation. That word joy means almost like a caress and a stroke, like a, a parent holding that child. Have you ever just held the child, stroke their hair to calm them down, right? It's that, that is what that joy means. Your joy, your, your sense of settling me down, your calm reassurance, that's what has brought consolation. What's that word consolation mean? Maybe you look that up. It means compassion, it means comfort. That calm consolation, that calm caress from God just in that spiritual sense is what is bringing comfort to my heart. It's not that my circumstances are changing. It's not that it's my joy that I'm somehow manufacturing, but it's outside of myself. It's God's gentleness to me in his calm, reassuring way that has brought consolation to me. We also see here with Daniel, he was troubled in spirit. Um, he was disturbed, deeply troubled. He says, deeply troubled. His face turned pale, like all the blood's draining out. Maybe he was near a fainting spell right then. He also says he was worn out and exhausted. That's how it feels. Habakkuk, body tremors, lips quivering. Um, just the, he says, rottenness entered into my bones. That's feeling it at a deep level. The legs trembling beneath me. And we see it also in Jesus and his disciples. Jesus in the garden, it says, in anguish, he was praying. His sweat was like drops of blood. He took Peter along with him and his disciples and he began to be sorrow, sorrowful and troubled. It says he's a man of sorrow acquainted with bitterest grief. So the disciples also, um, they're in the boat. The storm comes up. I, you may have heard that story before and they're questioning, don't you care? Isn't that how we feel sometimes when things are so anxious and not changing? Don't you even care? And they're asking God that. And then he comes to them and he reminds them of what? His presence and to have faith. And so why is the need for all these different examples? You know, it takes time for us to slow down and consider these things. If we're just racing, we're not slowing down. We're not thinking. So it slows me down, number one. Number two, it reminds me that I'm not alone. There are, is a litany of just his, historical people of the faith who've experienced the same thing that I'm saying, I'm not alone in that, I've experienced it. Those small groups, being able to talk about that um, helps too. It also reassures me that it's okay to express what I'm experiencing. This I love, this, um, I believe it was Ed Welch who was talking about this and so many other people have said this. We have a command with a promise. The Bible talks about don't be anxious, but it's not one of those like, don't you be anxious. <laughs> it's not one of those kind of commands. It's a command that comes with, I'm so concerned about you. It's kind of like calling out someone, be safe, be safe out there. Don't you always, I feel like people are telling me every time I turn around, be safe, be safe. Have you said that to someone today? That's what this is. It's like, don't be afraid be safe. Don't be afraid. And the promise is, it comes with a promise. I'm with you. Don't be afraid for I am with you. What a great little thing to remember. Just a few. There are thousands of verses in the Bible that I love to go to, especially in the Psalms. But here's just a few from other places in scripture that talk about the promise 
of God's presence presence with us to um, be strong, be courageous, to not be afraid or terrified because God is going with you. He's never going to leave you, never going to forsake you. How can we bring God into the dialogue? I'm always listening for someone, especially if they have uh, you know told me that they are someone of faith of where do I hear God in their story? Where does he show up or is he absent from their story? And that can be a gentle reminder. Um, he reminds us, I'm always with you to the very end of the age. My peace that I'm living with you, leaving with you. Psalm 121 says, lift up your eyes to the mountains. Where does your help come from? Your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That idea of lifting the eyes, lifting up. And that's how we nurture, by pointing people to God, linking them back with their faith. I love doing that in my practice. Helping ourselves, helping them reconnect to their faith roots, or maybe just re to, to rediscover um, or discover new faith roots that they can put down. So we are able to nurture as we remind ourselves and also as we remind others. Let's talk a little bit about this art of nurturing. Okay, so nurturing 101. All right. We know that we need to be loving people. We know we need to be listening to people, um, relating to them. You know, I've had friends tell me that it was so much easier for them to talk to me about certain aspects of their life and their journey because they knew a little bit of mine. And it was helpful for them to realize that I was walking through some very similar things, even though different, but similar. And they were so much more willing to open up. So especially if you're a counselor out there, I know there's kind of a whole thing about self-disclosure and where do we disclose something of ourselves? Where do we not? If you're in the peer space, you do a lot of self-disclosure. If you're an LPC, LMSW, LCDC, sometimes we kind of think about what do I want to disclose about my personal life and what do I not and so I like to just use this little illustration I don't know if you like Mrs. Dash but I love a good Mrs. Dash on top of some chickpeas just just a little bit just put a little dash in there a little dash of salt maybe so think Mrs. Dash just a little dash or if you're old school a little dab will do you <laughs> so sharing something brief but something relevant like I share that little story of the police knock at the door I get that feeling of fear and anxiety and what that was like um, I shared a little bit about just hey I'm on this road of infertility and I get grief you know that helps you relate you know a little bit to me and maybe be willing to open up about something similar in your own life so where can I love this person by listening. Some of us are real great at listening, real great at just sitting in the silence and hearing from someone asking great questions. So think about it. Where is it hard for me to listen? What's going on in my own mind and heart that may make it difficult for me to listen right now? And how can I be working on that so I can sit with someone and be a better listener? Acknowledging that you're a fellow struggler, struggler, discerning the needs, listening for those physical, emotional, cognitive, spiritual things. I like to think of it kind of like CPR. So in CPR, you come across someone, I took CPR recently, and so it's kind of on my mind, and you see the person laying there, and what are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to call for help for sure. So we you like, get the prayer going, get the vertical, like, God, I need some help here. Sit in the AED, sit in the spiritual AED. <laughs> but the other piece of that is looking at at scanning the body. We scan the body, right? And CPR, you scan the body, it's laying on the ground, you just go over there, start pumping on them. We look and see what's going on. So same thing with sitting with someone who's anxious. Let's scan the body. What do I notice? Are they, are their knees jumping? Wow, I'm seeing a lot of anxiety there. I, I can see that you are just, I see the tremors. I'm wondering if you feel even that tremor on the inside too. And letting them just like slow down and notice. In the group that I'm leading um, on with anger, we're talking about the same thing. Noticing how does anger show up in your body? How does anxiety show up in your body? We want to rush on to like, get me to the solution. Get this anxiety out of here, <laughs> which we'll get to. But we have to notice what's going on first. We have to slow down. We have to breathe. So um, being able to listen for the physical, listen for the emotional, that's the discerning part. What's going on cognitively with them? What are they saying? Are they what ifing? Are they maybe saying things about themselves that's shaming, that's not actually true? Where can I hear that from them? And then and then I'm, so I'm listening, like I don't just go start, you know, pumping on, on the body that's laying on the ground. I also listen for, are they breathing? Maybe there's some truth that they are believing. Sometimes we can be real quick to just what we want to fix things. We want to tell, let me just tell you that truth. Let me just put that on you right now. Cause I know you need this, but maybe they know some of those things. And if we let them breathe it out a little bit and have some space that would help them to be able to 
help us also to see where they're at. And then identifying um, both spiritual and physical interventions. We're going to talk about some specifics here. Um, think about for yourself, where am I really um, quick to want to jump to, maybe I just want to pray for them. I don't know if there's anyone here that's a pastoral or lay kind of counselor leader in the church, maybe that's not a licensed clinician, but sometimes in the church, we can be really quick. We want to, we, let's pray for that person. And that's so important. That's beautiful. That's a wonderful thing to do. Um, and we also want to realize there's other tools that we can provide to them that are going to help them be able to hear the prayer and maybe even be able to engage in that as well. So considering those things. Also encourage and follow up. So is there a truth that I can share after I've done all these other things, after I've loved well, listened well, discerned well, identified all these things, then how can I maybe ask, would it be okay if we prayed? I always like to ask someone, is, would it be okay if we did this? Is it all right if I pray? And then what kind of follow-up are they needing? Some people might need the daily. That doesn't mean it's from you. I'm always asking people, where other are your supports? Where are you? Where else are you connected? Are you connected with the Zoom kind of thing now where you can actually talk to other people? This Zoom call today, you're just hearing from me and you're chatting back in the comments. But in other calls, you're, all the faces are there and you can see people and that's so important. I know our church has weekly opportunities for people to tune in and actually be on camera camera to have be prayed for and talk with the pastoral staff. Um, we have um, various times, morning, afternoon, and night that they're doing that. And then also just um, the whole group together. So I don't know if there's any pastors here, but if there are, and you're just projecting the sermon or the, the music, sometimes being able to get everybody on the Zoom call, we can see all the faces. Okay, go ahead and mute everybody. But if you have to, because it can be like a cacophony if you've ever done that. But being able to see everybody, I was able to be on a Zoom call with my church recently, and it was so encouraging. See all the faces there. That meant so much. Okay, so then nurturing contentment. The opposite of anxiety and worry is a sense of peace, a sense of contentment. How can we do that? By humility, confession, acknowledging we need help. You know, it takes humility to say, all right, I don't got this. <laughs> like, I really have to humble myself and know that I need to ask for help both from God and from other people as well. Confession. Hey, you know what? I've been what ifing. I have been shaming myself in the middle of all of this. And so how can I pan out and see the bigger picture as well? I do want to say one piece on what I, one of my clients termed the shame tornado, <laughs> that I start having these feelings of anxiety or panic or anger, whatever that strong feeling is. And then because I'm having that and how I'm acting in that, then I start shaming myself for doing that and being that way. And that only just doubles down. And so we start kind of getting out our bricks and our mortar and building up this like shame box, you know, around ourselves. That's so unhelpful. So in humility, let me confess what is true about me. Let me confess and acknowledge this is hard and let me know that it's okay to ask for help. And then seeing the bigger picture, how can we pan out? If you've never watched the little clip by Francis Chan, have you heard of the Francis Chan episode that he's done? He's a pastor. Just Google Francis Chan the rope. That's all I'm going to say. Francis Chan the rope. You'll love it. But it's about pinning out. See the bigger picture here because when we're anxious, we're focused on just that big burly guy at the door, you know, the perceived or actual threat. But once we've kind of moved past that, what's the bigger picture? How can we pan out? 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. In this period of social, physical distance, we can still go spiritually deep. We can take these times of solitude to dig in and really being renewed. Um, and the rest of that verse says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's the bigger picture. So we fix our eyes. Where are we fixing our eyes? That's a question to ask someone. Where are you fixing your eyes right now? Fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary. This is a temporary situation we're in. But what is unseen is eternal. Lift the eyes. And then gratitude, A to Z list. And I don't mean, and I know you're thinking this, I don't mean A to Z things that you are grateful for, although that's a good one. That's a good one to do. But a gratitude list, A to Z, for who God is. This is linking people back, nurturing the soul, linking them to their faith. Who is God A to Z? And let's meditate on that. And that can be really helpful as well. Okay. 
Also volunteering, I threw that in there and let me know. Um, I would love just to see those flow through. What are some, you put your own A to Z, pick a letter of the alphabet, your letter of your name or something. And what is that characteristic of God that is most just encouraging to your own heart? And loved, I'd love to see those from you guys. So um, many of us have heard the passage in Philippians that speaks to not being anxious for anything, but with prayer and thanksgiving, presenting our requests to God. And the peace of God transcends all understanding. That's what's going to guard our hearts and our minds. And before that, he talks about backing it up, slowing it down. He talks about where our citizenship really is in heaven. He talks about who God is. And so based on all of those things of how confident he is and who God is, then we can say, okay, I don't have to be anxious. All right. And so a couple of steps towards peace for the anxious soul. These may be ones you want to note down. Noticing. So we've talked about this. This is something not just to notice in someone, but what you can encourage them to do as well. Have them pause, learn the cues for themselves. Where do they get fearful? Learn their body signals and signs. Number two, making it tangible. So writing it out, speaking it out, slow the process down. When we speak it, we slow it down. When we write it, we slow it down. Go with the flow and the flow is slow. I love that. Quantify the things that worry you. Okay, I'm just everything, I'm just worried about everything, they'll say, right? Well, what is everything? Write them all down, write all those everythings down. Nine times out of 10, there's gonna be maybe between five, maybe 10 things that they put down. There's not gonna be a thousand, there's probably not even gonna be a hundred. And that helps me see, oh, there's really not a hundred things. It's kind of just this one thing. And everything else I wrote down relates to that one thing. And that helps you to feel like, oh, that's more manageable. You know, that's not just everything, it's just one thing. And telling someone takes the power out of it. Hunting and gathering. Gather reasons to trust. The Lord is near. Slow down. Meditate on those things. Hunt for those things. Gather up those reasons to trust, reasons to be content. Go looking for God. Go looking for his character. Uh, am I practicing peace or am I practicing worry? Which side do I fall on? Expanding the conversation. What is, oh, I skipped one. Investigating and asking. What is ruling my heart? Those are questions you can ask. What desires, what wants, what values are feeling threatened right now? That's a journal exercise. These are little mini rulers that are trying to take over the throne of my heart. So Pallison, David Pallison says, most of the noise in our souls is generated by our attempts to control the uncontrollable. Where am I trying to control? And then five, expanding the conversation, bring God into the dialogue, how how, is he missing from the story? Do I hear him when I'm talking about this? Going through those Psalms, Psalm 23 is a, a favorite one. I'm encouraging people to connect back with songs and verses and things that were especially comforting to them back in the day. You know, Psalm 121 is another one. Psalm uh, Isaiah 41:10, fear not for I am with you. And then six, focusing on today. What do I need to get done right now? And I would ask that for you too, if you're feeling this pressure, overwhelm, what do you need to do right now in the next hour? And as Matthew 6 talks about, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. These are just some exercises, uh, decreasing physical tension, breathing as we know, singing, because singing, you're taking in a big breath of air and you're letting it out slowly to sing. So actually singing is deep breathing, blowing bubbles, that can be great for kids, but also adults too. Sleep stories, if you've never used a sleep story, I highly recommend them. You can even type into YouTube, Christian sleep stories. I will tell you, Every single time I listen to a sleep story, boom, I go to sleep <laughs> without fail. It works every single time. There was only one time that I made it through a whole sleep story. And after I started the second one, I was out. So it really works. I promise. Um, waving the arms, jumping, exercise, <laughs> stretching. There's something, especially in trauma, where they talk about cross body things. If you have, um, if you're familiar with EMDR or some of those other things, they talk about this kind of across big things like this. So I literally, if I'm feeling literally, I will do this. My husband will tell you, I will literally jump up and down. <laughs> in the kitchen. Like I am jumping, I'm doing my arms, I'm waving, I'm getting a little exercise. Before this talk today, I went on like a quick little mini jog walk and that was so helpful. Are you doing that? Are you exercising? Are you singing? Are you doing things that help? 
coloring, hobbies. What are your hobbies? Let us know. Also no caffeine after 3 p.m. <laughs> that will help as well. These aren't going to get to the root of anxiety, but it's going to give you a little reprieve, help you to be able to hear some truth. I had a client recently tell me, okay, I, I did that breathing thing. I thought about my feet being planted into the ground. I did that thing and it helped me to be able to stay present in that conversation instead of just fleeing away. It really does help. Decreasing the emotional tension. So time with friends, video, face to face, face to face, even if it's on the video. Um, I've saw uh, two ladies doing the social distancing, physical distancing, walking down the street, you know, and so they were staying apart, they were doing what we're asked to do, but they were still able to talk and take a walk like maybe they normally would have. The Voxer app, talking it out. If you've not heard of Voxer, I cannot more highly recommend. Great app, it's free. You can leave 15 minute messages for people. They can listen to you back later and it's not visual like that Marco Polo stuff. I don't know how many of you do that, but I got too many vi visual things going on over here. I can only do one at a time. So, but the Voxer app is great. We talked about journaling, truth reminders, putting those on cards, setting a timer, put it on your lock screen, identifying the voices, reframing things. Not, I am anxious, I am sad, are you is that the label I've had clients say I feel like you could just say anxious and that would be me that's my name that's an identity statement no you you are not anxious you're feeling that break it down what does that mean for you and instead I'm noticing that my body is feeling this way I'm noticing that I'm thinking this way I'm believing this way what are you noticing be an observer of yourself Okay, praying out loud, meditation, memorization. I won't have time to get into this, but I love, love, love this three trees diagram. This is put out by CCEF, Christian Counseling Education Foundation. Great way for someone who wants to work through where's the heat, that's say the heat is our current situation, our pandemic, and so it's not the pandemic that is causal. Okay, because there's other people inside of what we're dealing with right now that may not be feeling the same anxiety that we are. So it's not the situation that causes, but it is the situation that draws out from the heart, the things that we're struggling with, um, the things that we believe, the things that we value, the things that are our core at our core that we're holding on to tightly. And maybe some of those things could be shifted in some way. And so the third, the second tree is God, Jesus, who is God? What does he say and do in Christ? And this could be a whole, we won't get into this. This could be a whole topic right here. Um, but what can I believe based on who I know God to be and how will that change the fruit that comes out of my life? Um, so extra dose of support as well during this time. Um, if anxiety is feeling uncontrollable for someone, when do you need to reach out? If someone is not a licensed clinician, you're not already aware of these things, the worries that are causing an intense or extreme response, you're not able to get out of bed, you're not able to fulfill obligations to your family, to your work, those sort of things. Um, it's ongoing, continuous, you just can't seem to get a grapple on it. And it's leading, one thing I didn't put on here, but you find yourself going towards maybe an increase of substance use. Also, um, thought Thoughts of death, thoughts of suicide or harming oneself. Um, those are reasons we want to up the dose of support, go get some counseling or something like that um, and uh, get into a group or small group or something. Here's some local national resources. Um, I want to make sure you have these. This uh, one at the bottom there, the statewide COVID-19 mental health support line is one that it just recently came out over the next last month. And this is one that is operated by Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD program. They, it is a support line that is offering trauma-informed support and psychological first aid to those who are experiencing stress and anxiety related specifically to the pandemic. So that can be a really great resource that you can uh, let people have. Make sure all these numbers are in your phone. I'm always encouraging clients and clinicians have these in your phone. Some spiritual resources. I just put together a few things that are free and some of them, um, all of this, uh, is free, but there's a few things and within some of these websites that are for pay, but most of them are all free. There's some free Bible studies out there. I put just what our church is doing. If you don't already have a Sunday gathering, um, there are ways of connecting with churches, you know, if you're not already connected. Um, free courses from seminaries, that's D DTS is Dallas Theological Seminary, so some seminaries are even putting out free courses for people that may want to go a little deeper there. The Bible Story Project, now I'm kind of going from bottom up, but Bible Story Project is great both for uh, 
kids, teens, adults, all the above, visual representation, it's really, really good. So those are just a few there for you. Also some books um, that I wrote down are just ones that I have personally liked. I'll, there's tons, let us know, what are the books that you love <laughs> that are really helpful for you? And I think we're almost at the end here. So here's just some references. Um, I believe we're gonna be able to have this PowerPoint offer so you can have these references. I could not more highly recommend some of the sermons that I've drawn from for this presentation and some of these other links as well. So just a reminder, um, this is my contact information. I'm loving to connect with churches and with um, people who are in the hospice. I know we saw some people from hospice there. Um, love to do workshops for churches and helping their congregations kind of wrap their minds around how do we recognize warning signs of suicide and mental health and some of those things. And I am just so grateful for having this opportunity. Eric, thank you again so much. Um, I want to just end with a prayer. I think we have maybe five minutes left, maybe a little bit less than five minutes. Um, but I want to end with a little prayer, and then if there are any questions, hopefully I'll be able to grab maybe one or two of those. You're welcome to reach out to me as well via my email or phone. And of course, anywhere on Facebook, I'm on Facebook all the time. I love doing live video and would love to help you with live video if that's something you would love to dip your toe into. It's a lot of fun. But let me, let me just end by praying this over you. Um, I pray um, that out of God's glorious riches, this is from Ephesians, that he would strengthen you with power through his spirit right now in your inner being so that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you would be rooted and established in love. And I pray that you would have the power together with all of God's people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you would be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, you are a great speaker and you have some great material, and I really appreciate you. You've been our first webinar uh, for the Spiritual Care Network. So thanks again, Carrie. Yes, you're welcome. I see all you saying. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I was not able to watch the chat at, while I was talking, so I don't know if there were any questions that someone um, maybe mentioned, if there was something pressing that you would like us to address here in the last few minutes. I don't know, Eric, if you saw any there, but feel free to um, drop those again so that we can. Yeah, I saw some great comments too and some um, good. good information. So I saved this uh, chat and uh, I could send it to you as well. And great. A lot of people are asking for this PowerPoint to be posted on the website. So thank you for uh, allowing that. Absolutely. Posted on the spiritualcarenet.org website. So look for that. Give me give me a day or a few hours at least to do that. So yeah, I'm gonna have to work on figure out how to save it all in my head too. So wonderful. Yes. And if you um, if there were things listed in the chat that you did not want to lose because the chat itself will go away and I don't believe that's going to be part of the saved presentation. So if you are in the chat on the right hand side, you'll see three little tiny dots. If you tap on that, it'll say save chat and it will actually save it as a text document to your computer so you can have that. Awesome. Yeah, we, we really had a lot of great people all across Texas on this webinar today. Cool. And, um, and I'm just so thrilled of, of uh, the awesome people that joined us. Um, we do have some more coming up in uh, two weeks. We have some financial advisors that are gonna be on our uh, webinar talking about the stresses and the anxieties that come along with the financial market concerned about that myself. So um, if you want to find out more, um, you know, if you don't get the, the email blast, um, put on a link on the chat earlier today, um, or you could go to our website and sign up to, to receive the uh, emails. And uh, we also post a lot of stuff on our Facebook page if you are a, an active Facebook person. <laughs> so, yes, and someone was asking where, uh, if we could put down what website the PowerPoint will be able to um, will be on. Yes, will we be able to repost your video? I believe, yeah, the video is being recorded and I think you're gonna upload that, correct? Yes, I will upload that and <laughs> we'll try to post that on uh, Facebook as well. You know? And how can people get the CEU? Good question. Uh, right after this, there'll be a, a link posted. You click on the link to do your evaluation 
and then you will have the, um, the PDF of the certificate after you complete the evaluation. There's also going to be a follow-up email tomorrow with the same link, so if you don't get it right after this, uh, you'll get an email. Uh, special thanks to Brooke Martin for coordinating the CEUs today. She's okay. on the board and uh, has done a lot of wonderful work. Uh, so thank you, Brooke. There's her smiley face. <laughs> hey. <laughs> thank you all so much for tuning in and thank you for your responses. I have saved the, the text there so that I could go back and um, see everything that you were saying. So we so appreciate you being here and, and participating today. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you everybody for joining us. God bless. Bye-bye.